Sickness is idolatry because it is the belief that power can be taken from you. We see again that sickness has nothing to do with the body. To believe we are physically sick is a form of idolatry, for sickness asserts there is a power outside us that can take away our health. It cannot be said too often that sickness is never the physical expression of disease. Its symptoms, but only the insane belief there is something outside us. Jesus directs our attention to the mind's distorted thinking, not the distorted experiences of the body that are mere projections of the mind's idolatrous belief in the God of specialness. A sick and vicious deity, as we now read, Yet this is impossible because you are a part of God who is all power. A sick God must be an idol made in the image of what is what its maker thinks he is. And that is exactly what the ego does perceive in a son of God. A sick God, self-created, self-sufficient, very vicious, and very vulnerable. Lest anyone think this is a wonderful world, look at these passages and others like them. To the contrary, Jesus tells us this is a cruel and vicious world in which we believe we are vulnerable to hostile and irrational forces beyond our control. This means we believe we are capable of being attacked and justified in, our, in erecting defenses personally and nationally to protect ourselves. This insane thinking is the sickness belying the principle of atonement that tells us a part of God can never leave its source. For we rest ever secure and safe within his everlasting arms. Is this the idol you would worship? And this the image you would be vigilant to save? Are you really afraid of losing this? The universe arose from and is sustained by the thought that this idolized self needs protection, so terrified are we of losing it. Allowing ourselves to return to the presence of God in our mind, symbolized by Jesus, means we would lose this self. And so he asks whether this is really the image we want to preserve. How silly to protect an idol that is nothing. As we go through our day, we should not feel guilty as we see how much we seek to keep our special self alive and well. When we read passages such as the above and repeatedly hear these symphonic themes, we need to bring their message to our personal experience, observing how our fear of loss causes us to defend this false image through guilt's projections sickness, and attack. We turn now to some direct references to the first commandment. You could accept peace now for everyone and offer them perfect freedom from all illusions because you heard his voice, but have no other gods before him or you will not hear. The ego is afraid that the Holy Spirit's voice would call us to be at peace with everyone rather than be in the perpetual conflict that is our salvation, as the ego would have us believe. The problem is not that the Holy Spirit is not speaking or that Jesus' love does not call to us, but that we have erected other gods so we would not hear them. The ego's shrieks of separation seek always to drown out the mind's still small voice that speaks of atonement for all God's sons. Once again, sickness is not found in the body but in the mind's sick God of specialness, the idol our mind specifically made in order not to hear the atonement's call to be at peace. God is not jealous of the God you make, but you are. Here we see the Gnostic refutation of the biblical God's second commandment. How can the true God be jealous or care about idols that never were? Only the sick God of our imagination would feel such things. 
All our Creator knows is the undefiled and unseparated oneness of His love. You would save them and serve them because you believe that they made you. You think they are your Father because you are projecting onto them the fearful fact that you made them to replace God. We think we are the children of the ego. And chapter 11 will revisit the idea that we believe we are our own father. We made the ego, but believe it made us. We are then born into bodies, forgetting what took place in the mind and believing we are made by other idols, the body's false gods. A major theme of this chapter is that our fear is not of the ego or its, or its special idols, but of the fact that we believe we made the ego to replace God. And the guilt over this most egregious sin demands our punishment. The problem is always and only the mind's decision-making power that chose wrongly, not what it chose. Nothingness can never be fearful, being nothing, but the belief that what we made is real does cause our fear.